So first of all, I just want to thank the organizers for uh, hosting the event. I think it's very important to have this event where we have people from the academia and people from industry meeting and uh, exchanging ideas and building connections. Because like uh, Kit just said in the beginning, that uh, there is this gap between industry and academia, and it's very important for the industry, and I think as well as for the academia, to, to bridge the gap. And at Knox Medical, this is something which we are uh, working on constantly, and uh, because we have realized that there are things which can be done in academia which we cannot do, and there is talent in the academia which is very beneficial for us to use, uh, but we cannot uh, go after, I mean, we cannot do this work within the company. And then on the other hand, the company can bring a lot of interesting things for the, for the academia, and I think there's a win-win situation there. So let me just start with a brief history of, of uh, Knox Medical. Actually, the history of Knox Medical starts before Knox Medical. In uh, 1994, there was a company called Flaga, which was founded in Iceland. And the company Flaga was sorry, one of the first companies in the world to make uh, digital devices to record biological signals during sleep. And uh, in 2006, uh, the company was bought by foreign investors the company in Iceland was shut down and all the employees lost their jobs. There were a few employees there who knew nothing but how to build devices to record biological signals during sleep. And they thought, let's make another company. And they started Knox Medical in 2006. Today, Knox Medical is a company of 50 people. Of those 50 people, we have about half working in R&D. And of those 25 in R&D, there's actually about seven people, so it's like 15% of the company, which work on uh, research. And the people who work in research, their goal is not to, de to develop maybe the next new product, but to think about the future, think you know, more than six years into the future. Knox Medical is a company, it's a world leading brand in home sleep diagnostics, so it's in the medical sector. We have more than 12,000 devices out in the field and every year, more than one million people are diagnosed or their sleep problems are diagnosed using devices from Knox Medical. So the Knox Medical research team is led by two people. So it's my colleague, Katla Helgadottir, who is a psychologist, and myself, I'm an engineer, and our job is to take the latest developments in engineering and in medicine, bring them together to enhance sleep diagnostics. And we collaborate extensively with, uh, with the academy and we do it in certain levels. So at the base level, and this is for the young people here, is that we have interns which stay with us for one year. So these are typically young engineers just finishing their bachelor's degrees, and before heading out to get a master's degree, they come to us and they work for one year. And these are actually the guys who are doing all the cool projects and all the heavy lifting. And we have two of them, or th let's say three of them today, but one of them is actually a real engineer. And they will be at our booth, so you can talk to them there and hear what they're doing. We also participate in master studies, so must projects with master students. But mostly, and what most of our time goes into, is collaborating with external researchers, like the IIIM, like DCOD, like the University Hospital in Iceland, Harvard, Stanford, and many more. So we're really col collaborating with the scientists. And the question is why? I mean, why, why do you want to do this when you're a company? Why do you want to work with academia? And if you look at the evolution of sleep medicine, and I was just because earlier today we were talking about the DFKI was founded in 1988, and this picture is actually from 1988. So at the time when they were finding uh, artificial intelligence in Germany, sleep medicine was at the time where you had analog amplifiers connected to humans, and they were writing out the output with pen on paper. This is 1988, and the diagnostics of sleep uh, disorders were mostly standardized in the 60s. And so what happens, you have people that are sleeping eight hours, and the signals are recorded on paper, and one page is 30 seconds. And then there's a guy, poor guy like this uh, sleeping guy up there. He has to manually flip through every of these 1,000 pages and trying to figure out what's wrong with a person. <laughs> um, but this was a long time ago. So what has happened since then? In the Flaga days, they made the digital recorder, so the devices became smaller. You can put them on small children. And today, you have even smaller devices, which are run on batteries, so people can you know, go to the bathroom after they've been hooked up. And instead of flipping through these 1,000 pages on paper, you can now flip through them on your computer screen. 
but basically nothing has changed. So this is the reason why we want to collaborate with people and uh, make the changes. So if you think about the picture, you have the doctors who are developing the medicine, they can only use the technology which is available. And if they work on their own, they can kind of reach a local optima. They can find the best way of using the available technology. Then you have the people who are maybe working on machine learning or something. They can use the knowledge of the doctors and make models to automate it and do automated uh, diagnosis, but they can never pass the doctors because they cannot invent medicine. And then you have industry and they can just choose a new color palette and make a smaller device, but they cannot go further than science. So now the re reality in sleep medicine today is that we're stuck in a local optima. And we've even realized that the medical procedures, the diagnostic procedures that we use, they don't correlate very well with clinical outcomes. So we want to change this. And the way to change it is to work together. And this doesn't happen in a vacuum. And so it's a, you know, it's a broad interdisciplinary work and it needs you know, a lot of factors so it works. Most important factor is the people. You know, we need to have people which are driven towards the same goal and they're motivated to work towards this goal. And these people can be in you know, universities, institutions, and in, in industries. And we need the people who are the medical experts, who know the technology, and who are the industry who can make the products and you know, get them to the masses. And then there's also the, the environment that we work in, you know, the government, the politics. And this, you know, here I become very political, but the government can really facilitate this kind of collaboration. And one way to do this is through funding, I will talk about this extensively, but also through regulation. Like we were talking earlier this morning about the new uh, le legislation about the, the data protection, the GDPR. It was a very good thing for industry to have like clear regulation. What can you do with data? What can you not do with data? Just want to talk about funding for research and I call it investment in research. Why is it an investment? It's the, the government is giving money to companies, for example, like Knox Medical, we've received 125 million Icelandic kronos from Rannis and Tagnethron Sur, and it's very helpful. And Knox Medical would not be in Iceland today if we had not received this funding. For every Icelandic krona that we received in funding from the Icelandic government, we've had two from European Union. So that's a return on investment. And also the R&D tax refund is very important for companies like us. And the return on investment for the government to have companies like us is that they have put maybe 400 million Icelandic kronos into the company and the company has brought 8 billion back into the economy. So that's like a 20 times return on investment there. And this is very important to us and having this support is one of the key things that we can actually have room to work on things which are not directly you know, increasing sales coming up with the next product. So what do we do? Uh, I'm going to tell you about this project that we're starting with the IIIM. And this project would not have happened if we hadn't received the funding from Rannis for this applied research project. And the project is, has three parties. So it's Decode, it's IIIM, and it's NOX. And I'm just going to give you an example of what we can do in such a project. So today, when you're sleeping, uh, people, the doctor will say that you sleep in one of five sleep stages. A sleep stage is 30 seconds of time, which is defined by the paper that we had earlier. And they say this belongs in one of five classes. And we are all humans, we all sleep, we all know that we don't sleep in 30 second increments, <laughs> for one. And we probably don't sleep in five discrete stages. But this was the technology which was standardized in the 60s. And it's detected from complex biological signals, an interplay between many biological signals which are happening in the brain, in the eyes, and in the muscle tone and activity. But in the 60s, they came up with this uh, very non-deterministic set of rules to uh, classify how we sleep. And this is how the signals look like. And so this poor guy who was sleeping, he's looking at these signals and saying, oh yeah, this is sleep and two, this is wake, blah, blah, blah. And uh, after 1,000 pages, I know this is what he looks like. Uh, and 
this is something that a company like Knox Medical, we can automate this, and we can do our own machine learning, the tools are available, and this is exactly what the, our interns are doing. You know, they're running Keras and learning on, uh, on labeled data, and we can make this automated classification. But we're not learning anything new about sleep. We're not making any progress, we're just making evolution. So, there are much more complex patterns in the human body, and because the human body is like a machine and it has many systems and they work together and they complement each other so if something changes here then something changes there and you're back to normal and you know it's like it's everything is like moving together and a human may not pick this up easily and even if we understand like where they say on this figure here what they're talking about there is the coupling between respiration and heart rate so if you're looking at the flow trace of respiration, you're looking at the ECG of the heart rate, I mean, a human is not going to say, ah, this is the kind of coupling, and this is the frequency of coupling. And the, I mean, you, even if you see the signals, you understand the physiology, you, you cannot pick it out by eye. So there are more complex patterns there that we can look for. And what we aim to do in this project is like data-driven sleep medicine. And this is a great project because Knox Medical is making hardware, and we had to make new hardware so that Decode could collect the data that they needed. Decode is collecting, it's doing a big health study. They're measuring 10,000 Icelanders per year. And they collect health data, they collect clinical data, and they collect sleep data. And they're collecting five gigabytes of sleep data per day. And uh, they can link the data to outcomes and to health. I, triple I am, I mean, they're experts in crunching data. And they can use their knowledge to look for new predictors of health and new uh, patient groups. And they can identify which signals are important to investigate and do things which uh, you know, we cannot do as an industry. But we are happy to add into our products once they're ready or if they become ready. Maybe it doesn't work. That's fine. At least we tried. So this is where I end. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, two or three questions, let's see. Um, I'm sure there are some. <coughs> yes, I knew it. <laughs> uh, we have a university hospital here in Iceland. Yes, it's very good. I mean, it's good to have it's it here. It's really cool feel its name as a university hospital. This is a very good question. And uh, I don't know the hospital well enough to answer it, but I can tell you this. Having a university hospital, which is running efficiently and can do research, because they have to set aside research resources to do research, is very important for companies like Knox Medical, Decode, and for us to you know, advance the medicine. So this is one of the political things which can be done to uh, really improve the environment that we, we work in. I, don't, I cannot answer the question, but I say it's very important. So the answer is very important, but we don't have it. I mean, it's, I, I, yeah. I can just tell you what they say on the news. Yeah, uh, let's see. Yeah, hi. Uh, so obviously you are using a lot of Yes. And unfortunately, uh, I was discussing this morning, uh, but uh, it seems that legislation is supposed to protect uh, our data and uh, the security between stuff that's transferring data is uh, not up to date. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think? Do we need like, a pocket to help the legislators uh, make the laws uh, more up to date? Or how can the legislators make sure that uh, they do is uh, secure for the moment? Okay, that's a little bit hard to answer. I think the only way that they could make sure is to do an audit, but I'm not asking them to audit us, <laughs> <laughs> honestly. But what needs to be done and what we discussed this morning is that the, the regulation needs to be clear and everybody who's working with the data needs to understand exactly what is allowed and what is not allowed. Uh, maybe one way to kind of certify you know, that people who are working with data are actually 
uh, fulfilling what they need to be doing is you know, some kind of certification and uh, audits, of course, something like this. I mean, this is the only way that we can really trust it. Because as we discussed today, I mean, you buy a car. How do you know the brakes work? Because there is a company that has certified that they work. And that's the only way you can know it. But here, clarity of the rules is the key thing. Would it would be illegal for you to sell this information to uh, It's not our information to sell. So we don't collect the data. It's the hospitals who collect the data. And Decode, in the other sense, they collect the data. And it's not our data. And we can have, if we get the permission, we can have permission to work on the data, but it's not our data to sell. And this, of course, it's an interesting question because this, of course, uh, uh, pertains to the, the, what, what meaning does the sleep data have for uh, you know, to be out in the open? Uh, personally, even though I, I, I tend to have the occasional you know, sleepless night, I wouldn't, I couldn't care less if my sleep data was on the internet. Um, but that's my decision to make, of course, and it should be. Um, however, in, in the cases where uh, the development of new technology, new medicine, etc., is, uh, it depends on access to such data. We need to make sure that that happens without uh, breaking any, any rules uh, of conduct for that data that we all agree on should apply. Now, that does not speak, of course, to the deficiency that, that Bidbita was mentioning. Uh, if the laws are deficient, that, that does not solve that problem. So, um, well, that's a great uh, exit, and uh, thank you very much. Thanks.